Hi, today I'm going to be talking about neurology and neuroscience and NLP. I'm involved in the NLP Leadership Summit, and a discussion that we've recently been having online is how does neurology play into neuro-linguistic programming? Now, we all know that the neuro of our mind has to deal with all of the cells and atoms and fibers and connections and chemicals that your brain creates with every single thing you see or say or taste or touch or smell or hear. Everything creates that, that neurological connection. What we really don't know is how that works because NLP doesn't have a lot of rigorous scientific evidence behind it. And for some, that's a bad, bad thing because they need that rigorous scientific expert advice. For me, I don't know, I'm more anecdotal. So the evidence that NLP works and how it works, for me, I've seen it over the past 20 years in examples from myself and my students and my clients. So I know NLP works and I, I know and I understand a lot of the scientific aspects and neurological aspects of it, but I probably don't understand it as well as we could if there were the research. There's a, a neuroscientist named Miguel, um, N Miguel Nicholas. He's a, a neuroscientist from Brazil and he works at Duke University in the United States and he has been over the past many years doing a lot of research about our brains creating reality and the research that's really expanding neurological science to catch up with what we've known about in a, for a long time in NLP but probably s now starting to create the connection of really what's happening in the brain. You know, we know in NLP and just from psychology and science what the different chemicals in our brain do like dopamine and serotonin and um, all of those chemicals. But as a combination, we don't really know what happens. So we know various things like, you know, dopamine, what dopamine can do. But dopamine, depending on where in the brain it's coming from and what other chemicals are combined with it, does something different. Now, something that I didn't understand, but now I do, and it really is helping me to understand the evolution of neuroscience and how recently, if you've noticed, they're, they're coming leaps and bounds with the information that they're understanding about the brain. Now, neuroscientists used to work in silos. You know, the motor neuron people would work on them, you know, with themselves and only look at motor neurons. They're the neurons that help us move. Uh, and we've got other neurons about speech and connection, sight, um, emotions, and each of those neuroscientists that would be specializing in one type of neuron would only work with that one type of neuron. And instead of working with groupings of neurons, they were working just within a small stream of them. What uh, Miguel Nicholas is doing is he's expanding the research and he started to look at, if we start looking at populations of neurons, starting with one and then 12 and 20 and 40 and 50 and upwards different groupings of neurons, what makes the difference? And what he really started to figure out with the use of lab rats and monkeys and things like that is it's not just one part of your brain that, that is changing with the neuroplasticity. It's many aspects and many parts of your brain that are, are changing. And especially with some, some work they were doing with some, some lab rats. And if you've met me, you know that in my psych degree, we learned a lot about lab rats and dog salivating. And it's not my favorite topic, but they have a place. Now, one of their researches had to do with um, connecting the neurons to a computer so that we could actually watch what was happening in the brain. And they were getting a, a rat or a mouse to push a little lever, and when they pushed the lever, they would get the food. Eventually, what they found out is that, or they, they were being able to sequence back from the computer, is they could respond with the computer so that if, without touching the lever, the mouse could actually just think about touching the lever, and food would disperse. And after a little while, the rat stopped pushing the lever and just started thinking about pushing the lever and the food would, would dispense. 
Now, this is interesting in many aspects because there's so much thought about what happens creates our reality. And in NLP, we know that our reality is created by how we think about reality. That our brain is already two steps ahead or three or four steps ahead of where our body is. And that constantly our brain is actually imposing on the world instead of our world imposing on the brain. So if I am going to a networking meeting, they're not my favorite thing in the world. And probably even just by that facial expression, you can tell that as soon as I thought about the networking meeting, various chemicals went through my body going, I just don't really like those things. You know, random people wanting to sell to each other about something instead of just meeting and connecting. I don't know. But our mind is always taking on a, a hypothesis without our consciousness being involved. My conscious mind, that's my analytical thinking, reasoning mind, it doesn't need to be involved at all. My unconscious, non-conscious mind is making a hypothesis. It goes, mm, meeting, don't like it. And it's already getting me ready for it based on what has already happened. So my brain is actively producing what my reality will be in this moment. Uh, I just came home from Spain and sitting next to me was a lady who was very, very nervous when we took off in the airplane and she was very nervous because about 10 years ago she was on a flight in um, an African country like Morocco and she said that the plane was up for two minutes and it had to take a, a landing back at the airport but it missed the um, runway. And so there was a, a two minutes in the air, a minute or so landing, crash landing, but everyone was safe. But it was just a horrific experience for her. And so every time the plane begins to go and she put her headphones on so she could block out the engine noise, that revving up engine noise of the plane getting faster in order to take off. And eventually I was, you know, watching her and I was being able to be sensory acute that she kept looking out the window to see what was happening. And after a couple minutes of that, I actually shut the blinds and she said, oh, thank you very much, because that deprived her of one sense. But there was still her auditory, her feeling, and she now couldn't see outside. She kept looking the other way, and I wish I could reach across the other side of the airplane to shut that down. But her brain was making reality of what had happened in the past. So even though I'm, I couldn't tell you exactly what's happening neurologically in the brain, we do know that NLP creates that neurological change within us. Because when we start to change a belief, when we start to recode or decode and then recode a pattern or a memory, then we're changing how the the chemicals are being distributed in the brain and we're starting to change how the mind makes meaning therefore changing the potential hypothesis so her hypothesis getting onto an airplane is that she doesn't like and she gets very anxious which i saw the taking off and turbulence of an airplane ride we can change that utilizing a variety of NLP techniques, VK dissociation, tunneling, parts integration, spinning emotions. We have the ability to actually alter how the brain is creating those triggers, collapsing some of those anchors, if you will, so that we have a new type of reality. We have a new hypothesis to go to. Most of the time when I meet people that are unfamiliar with NLP, they think that how their current, how their mind is currently coded, their current beliefs, their current behaviors, that's just set in stone and that's just what is happening. But that's not necessarily true. You are in charge of your mind, therefore your results. If there is a pattern or an emotion or a memory that is not working for you, then we can change that. And we can change the neurological conditioning so that the cascade of a variety of different chemicals and different hormones give you a different hypothesis. So therefore a different result. Because whatever the hypothesis your mind creates, that becomes your reality that becomes your reality. If a person has a belief that they're not good at relationships, the moment they get into a relationship, that hypothesis begins. And if we have a hypothesis, we can usually prove it right. I would rather help you prove it wrong. Help you to, and you may already know how to do this, how to 
figure out how what the the connections of your programs and patterns are the emotions the states and moods that you get into so that you can be more in control of what's happening in your life and therefore even if we don't have a scientific understanding of exactly what's happening in the brain and I know there's some researchers that are doing some great research with NLP and eventually they'll figure out exactly what's happening but even from that anecdotal and personal experience, you're in charge of it. You're in charge of that hypothesis that, you, hypothesis that you create. And what you do think, how you do react, is ultimately up to you. So neurology, neuroscience, and NLP, we're still just beginning to understand.